Hello, everybody. We are welcome in this uh, Executive API webinar on API-led integration, how to understand and master technologies and techniques to achieve, to achieve greater productivity, especially around APIs. We will start the webinar in like a few seconds. We'll just wait everybody to connect. And uh, we will uh, be glad to have uh, with us uh, Tony Curcio, uh, Director of API Management, uh, Gateway, and High Speed Transfer at IBM. Hi, Tony. How are you? Great, Mandy. How are you? I'm doing really well. I'm doing really well. I'm really glad to do this uh, webinar uh, with you on a topic that really matters uh, for me, uh, like helping companies to understand how they, what they can learn from, it, let's say, API-driven models, the API mindset, to uh, like become more productive, more agile, uh, more resilient. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm really glad we're doing this uh, together. Yeah, thanks. I feel, feel the same way. Uh, you know, uh, there's so many different customers that we work with that are on different points of their journey. You know, and I think, uh, you know, given the things that you and I have worked on together for today, uh, got something a little bit for everybody. So looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, um, it also, it's it's quite rare that I talk directly in the webinars. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, it's really because it's a topic that matters. Uh, uh, for me and for all the EPIDs community. Uh, um, so so le let's go. Le let's go for with everybody. So uh, we will start this, e this API webinar on the complete API strategy model. And just to say this webinar is brought to you by uh, uh, partners. So the first one is API Days uh, conferences, the main series of conferences on APIs. Uh, we have events Used to, they used to be physical, but now they are still online, but we kept the city name, right? And our next one will be API Days London next week and API Days Paris in six weeks, which, are, which will be two big events. So don't hesitate, you can register on API Days.co. Uh, API Days is more than 51 events, so 200,000 online community members, uh, and like uh, almost 2,000 speakers. So at some point, every API expert has been has been a speaker at API Days. Uh, don't hesitate to reach uh, on the web to reach us uh, if you want to participate in one of these. It's also brought to you by API Scene, the media platform uh, for API news. Uh, so if you are interested to read news directly provided by the practitioners, or if you want to write and contribute on uh, on APIs, you can go on apiscene.com and you will be able to contribute also yourself. And uh, again, uh, we, we thank uh, IBM for organizing with us this webinar. You can discover more on, uh, on solution of, of, of IBM on developer.ibm.com or uh, on API management solution on IBM uh, portal. So let's dive into the content. This is why uh, we're uh, all for. And I will start uh, uh, preceding uh, Tony uh, to explain a little bit what I call the complete API strategy model. It's a presentation I, I made recently at some uh, CIO conferences, Gartner conferences, and I wanted to share it with you, uh, introducing what Tony will, will share with us. So a little bit about me, I'm the founder of API Days Conferences, I'm a partner in API First, API's first consulting. I've been um, um, uh, mandated by the Europe, European Commission to help governments to adopt the APIs, and I'm lecturer in some business schools about how IT can, can help the business better. Uh, also co-author of the book, uh, Continuous API Management. Uh, so I'll try to give you all the knowledge I accumulated in this, in this talk. I also designed the API landscape. It's the 500 API companies you should look at, uh, either on a tooling or on the business process as a service. Uh, you will be able to download it on epidays.co uh, uh, website. So let's start by uh, this quote, this recent quote from two weeks ago from the CEO of Twilio, Jeff Lawson. Uh, the world is getting broken down into APIs. Every part of the stack of the business that a developer might need to build is eventually turning into APIs that developers can use. And it's extremely important because exactly, it seems that the 100 century uh, old uh, supply chain industry is becoming now completely digital. And now we have this digital supply chain that is completely powered by APIs that connect with each other, that connect business with each other and that deliver value uh, on, on, on the line. So it reminds me this this photo uh, for people who don't know an average the average number of nuts and bolts and all the pieces of a car is around thirty thousand, uh, and so actually the role of the car manufacturer is to produce some but mostly managing the ones that, that are available on the market, managing hundreds of suppliers that 
that produce and deliver and assemble all these parts. The goal of the manufacturer is really to design and understand the customer needs, right? And, and to design the car and distribute and sell uh, the car. But the whole manufacturing process is actually highly uh, um, uh, uh, decentralized, but also um, uh, uh, manufactured, manufacturer based. So what happens, what does that mean for APIs? It means that if we compare with APIs, it seems that we have provide API providers who have capabilities that connect with API consumers to deliver these capabilities. But on the other side, the API providers are also consumers of other API providers. So you understand the digital risk supply chain management here that, that's happening. And this is why I call the complete API strategy model is that we need to think in the world of digital infrastructure where organization will provide core competencies through APIs to their customers, and they will consume core competencies of all their companies through APIs. So it's like a, a circular economy where you provide APIs to others to integrate, and these APIs may be also be integrated by some companies uh, you know, to, uh, to deliver value. So if we go back a little bit like the supply chain, it seems that what comes into my system, what are my suppliers, are the third party APIs that I integrate. So the integration is really key. I have my internal APIs. It's my internal processes. It's my internal added value. It's all the intelligence and the processes and the business logic that I add to the data that comes into my system. And I have also open APIs to connect with partners, with ecosystem, with innovative uh, companies to be able to do business development and spread my value on the market. So let's see what does that mean for a company today who need to think about this third party internal and open APIs. So that means that for third party, the, as I say, the goal is really about integration. So we'll talk about integration strategy. For the internal APIs, it's really about agility, reducing IT costs, reducing also time to market for, with the ability to use reusable bricks. What, are, what I, I also call the business breadth. On the open API side, uh, it's really about B2B integration, partnership, business development. It's about innovation with startups and companies that are developing niche markets on top of your assets. And we will see that it's also about compliance because many, many countries now are obliging companies to open APIs in different industries. Let's focus on the internal API first. So on the internal APIs first, the main goal is to align business with IT and align IT with business. So all reminds uh, all of this came at least uh, in 2002 when Jeff Bezos, CEO and founder of Amazon, sent that email to all its employees. So it's a known, quite known email uh, about that that all the team will enforce uh, will henceforth export their data and functionality through service interfaces. Team must communicate with each other through through these interfaces. So it's a, it's an email that really talks about you know how we should do how we should manage communication inside the company. But the more important sentence here is the fifth point, right? Is that all service interfaces, without exception, must be designed from the ground up to be externalizable. That is to say the team must plan and design to be able to expose the interface to the developers in the outside world, no exception. That means we, don't, we, will, we, should, we should not externalize everything, but it should be externalizable, right? It should be ready to be open to customers, right? To be reactive, right? To expose capability to others. And since, since then, Amazon has completely changed the way they build services internally. And they build two years later, uh, uh, they had this idea of Amazon Web Services. And now Amazon Web Services is like 6,000 services exposed directly to the ecosystem that they are also internal services, right? So that's really worked for Amazon to think about how they think they should have internal services that should be exposed at any time for developers when it's needed. Of course, all the services are not exposed, but you know the one that needs to be are. The funny part of the email, if you read the last sentence, is that anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. Thank you, have a nice day. That's really uh, uh, Jeff Bezos style, strong governance here. But just to say that, yeah, it's also a momentum that you need to drive in the company. So if you are able to align IT with business, what does that mean? That means that the, with internal APIs, the IT's role is completely reinvented. The IT's role used to control corporate data, make it secure, make it available, make it clean, and build applications. But this could work, this could be two, three, five, seven years long for some companies. But now, if we think in terms of APIs, the role of IT is kind of changing because now the role is still control the data, make it secure, available. 
but they find policies for data use inside the company with subsidiaries uh, and with partners, build and maintain these APIs, these building bricks uh, of capabilities, right? That expose services into uh, products that uh, the business can use and then build applications based on these reusable bricks or let other people build application thanks to these bricks. This is an example of uh, the, the last five years, the company uh, has done exactly this. The company's BBVA, the, the Spanish World Bank, even if it, 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 it's a bank that also uh, happens to work in the US and in, and in Europe. But yeah, they expose directly reusable bricks that, are, uh, that they use internally for their, in their systems to third-party applications to be able to build new banking applications based on their infrastructure but they are still able to uh, to deliver value for customers in Spain or, or in, in, in Europe or in the US. And you can see all these bricks are actually kind of product. They have a name, the retail customer API, the retail account, the retail loans, the business accounts APIs, right? So this is this idea of now we will think the, the how we build applications in terms of brick that we will use internally to build our own applications or that we will let others build application with. And actually, it has been also validated by research. Uh, Martian van Aslin, he's a professor of Boston University and at the MIT. And he also book, wrote the book Platform Revolution. And actually, he made a study in 2017, right, about the impact of APIs in firm performance. And he found that for 50 companies, that for, for 200 companies, that was, that was um, uh, 200 companies, that was uh, over $2 billion of, of, um, of, um, of valuation, Right, uh, he found that in average, the company who have a strong internal API consumption and API programs are in have in average a 12.7 percent higher public valuation. You know, all these companies were public companies, but he found that yeah, it seems the market reacts better and invests better and trusts better companies where, who are showing uh, uh, agility or who are actually enabling integration with their ecosystem. So yeah, it's important to, if you are a publicly tr traded company, yeah, having strong API uh, uh, adoption internally can actually lead to some uh, 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 branding and influence results to the market. The second part is with APIs, you can design for, you can design your capabilities for business goals. So often APIs are described as Lego bricks, but if we do so, the, the body of the brick is really the service and the plugs are really the interface to connect the service with, with other systems, right? But if you see, if you design the brick, right, and you design the plugs toward business capability, you will be able to change maybe the service, but not breaking the interface, not breaking the API, the technical and the business contract. So that's the goal of designing APIs towards business capabilities that towards implementation. Technology change more often than the, let's say the core business. Right? So if you design to your core business capabilities, you will change less uh, your interface than if you design towards technologies. And so you will, you will have to change a lot of, lot of time in, in, in decades, like five, six, seven times all your infrastructure because the APIs were designed towards the, the, the implementation. So that's what Werner Vogel, CTO of Amazon Web Services, used to say. Uh, we knew that designing APIs was a very important task as we had only one chance to get it right. He also said that APIs are forever. The code behind the, the body of the brick, the, the code of the service can change. But if the API are really designed towards business capabilities, the APIs are forever to always serve the business. And so we can see, for example, in what we know, like uh, this is 100 years of car history, the interface actually almost never changed, right? It, the, the engine has changed, the technology has changed, but yeah, uh, not the interface, right? So what, uh, why do we need to change for your infrastructure, right? If the business is the same, if it's still delivering loans to customers, if it's still delivering uh, uh, retail goods to uh, to suppliers, yeah, it's the same idea. And so, if you so, let's remind that if you design APIs toward business capabilities, you will be able to change the service, but not breaking the API. That comes to my third point: killing technical debt. A lot of people are have actually working with big monolith that do like WXYZ uh, capabilities, right? Technical capabilities. But if you have a, an, an interface that represents these this technical capabilities into business capabilities, you will be able, as you see on the right, to build standalone services, sometimes called microservices, right? 
but and over and over you will be able to replace the part of your monolith right in your technical functionalities right to at the end replace the whole monolith and get rid of uh, millions of dollars of licenses right with standalone services that represent the same capabilities but never breaking the api because the api has been always designed toward business capabilities of course it's longer than this it takes few years to do it it has to be done uh, uh you know uh, safely and, and and you know but on the concept right this is really uh, how we can use what we call the api facade pattern right designing the facade towards the business so we can have a relief on the technical implementation that we can replace over time. The third, the, the, the other one is really diminishing the time to market to reuse these existing capabilities. So just an example, if we build application with a full application logic with non-reusable components, right? right? Instead of doing what we do, like reusable bricks that connect with each other with APIs, right? We will spend a lot of time into uh, delivering software that is costly and that's and that's quite long to produce. If we have an ecosystem of building bricks that are reusable, right, that are connected with APIs, we will be able to reduce your application logic, build application faster, reusing existing assets. But the most important is not only reducing IT cost, the most important also is reducing time to market. It's faster to develop a new application because the bricks are actually uh, ready to use, right? So that's extremely important. It's also beneficial because you invest more in reusable components, more than non-reusable components. And so it should align IT and business at least on, on this point. And this is what, for example, Uber did. Right? They had the monolith architecture on the left, right? Really monolithic, but at some point they tried to go on more, you know, let's say APIs are building bricks, uh, right? And, and different services that connect together with, with APIs to be able to deliver faster uh, their application and uh, and make the application a little bit more agile into uh, evolving. The fifth point is really get business adoptions internally because most of the time what IT produce, the business doesn't understand it. So it's really hard for them to support with budget or support with, uh, uh, with executive sponsorship. But if we build uh, building bricks, right? Actually, the, our users and customers, they see the shadow of the brick. They see their own representation of your technical capabilities for maybe an sms api for example that just send text messages is actually a validation for uh, a validation for a ride or it's validation for uh, a security uh, a security or maybe it opens a lock into a connected locker right so the business aspect right will be the it's the customer who decide the business to the brick you're building so to have business support, you will need to put your bricks into the business context. So I'll just share you, for example, just imagine I tell you that we've developed internally these building bricks, right? That doesn't make any sense. It's really hard for someone to understand actually what's available. This is MS13949, the kind of microservice, whatever. But what's it useful for? You know, whatever. These are real namings I've seen in the, my consulting practice, right? It's really hard to understand, you know, that what the IT delivers, it seems they deliver stuff only for themselves. Okay, but just to reimagine now we productize these services. We, we, put, we put business uh, vision into these, right? Just imagine now it's a user's info API, it's a driver's info, it's a payment API, invoicing, geolocation, ratings, pricing, maps, SMS API. Now for the business, it's easy to understand that actually, yeah, I can orchestrate these. I can find, I can mix some of these, um, you know, to be able to do an application like ride sharing. So it's, it's not only about what we want to do, it's also about what's available, right? That can inspire the business. And if you, the IT delivers things that the business can understand, right? The, the IT will get support into, into, into more, um, into more uh, budget and also more, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, adoption of, of, of their uh, project and engagement. So actually inside Uber, there are many, many more services. Not all the services are kind of productized and easy to understand. There are a few hundreds of them, but yes, that tells you a little bit, uh, you know, how at least you can, uh, uh, you can uh, have the business onboarded with you. Let's focus now on partner APIs. On partner APIs, it's why you open to others. So the, the sixth point is really, you can maximize your rich market, you know, with uh, integration by third parties. So we used to say that in 2000, to be digital, you need to have a website. In 2010, to be digital, you need to have a mobile application. 
to have, have your own channel. But in 2020, you need APIs actually to be in everybody else's website or in everybody else's mobile application, right? So this is how you maximize your reach and you to achieve full potential because you will be able to be everywhere. It, it makes sense to have you integrated. So it's not only your own channels, it's also, it's also everybody else's channels that you can integrate and colonize with your business value. So just an example, uh, you know, this, it, this is called by Chris Anderson, the long tail strategy. But for example, you, we used to have web channels, right? With a certain type of users and customers, a certain number. Mobile channels that came later. Now, sometimes it's even more than web. But now we have all these different channels, the partner integrations, the connected devices, the e-commerce integration, suppliers, ERP, CRM, whatever. But how we can reach all these channels by, you know, because these channels have diminishing returns. It's, it costs us a certain amount to reach all of them. And at some point, it costs us more to reach them all. So the long tail is significant in terms of cumulative traffic and reach, but it's costly to address unless you have APIs that enable you to reach all in once. And so if you make the sum of all the channels, right, change the colors to see, actually maybe your third party channels are your main channel. So having an API strategy externally helps you to reach all these channels with the same interfaces, the same work that's reusable. This is what Simon Torrance, advisor uh, for, uh, on finance for the World Economic Forum, called, for example, the embedded finance, right? He said that if banks are not integrated only in their own application, but if banks are integrated into real estate application, car dealership application, wedding planner application, and insurers the same, I, the size of the market is actually the double of the current market today. So banking outside banks is twice bigger than banking inside banking channels. Right? So that's the idea of APIs for reaching more, uh, uh, more, more channels and achieving maximum potential. The seventh point is about new business models, because now you have, if you open APIs, internal capabilities, you will be able to monetize them. You will be able to monetize them in different aspects. So the business models are quite complex, can be complex, right? Uh, this is the, what I call the dimension of API pricing. Right? But it can be about freshness of the data. Is it old data, new data? The flow of the data? Is it more stock of data? Do you want more stream? It's about the precision of the data. Right? If you sell a credit score, for example, it can be quite average or quite accurate. It's about how it's consumable. Uh, right? It's about the scope. Do you have a small access per country, whatever, or you have full access? The quantity of the data, the performance of the service. Right? Do you want SLA right? so for the service to be delivered uh, uh, always on time or do you accept to wait, right? It's about the maintenance, the support, the license of the data, and even the branding. I've seen some API companies who said, you can use our APIs for free and unless, uh, as long as you put our names that powered by us, right? You know? So that's enabled new business models of monetizing internal assets that are in under capacity, right? That are over capacity for you, but in completely in underserved in terms of, uh, of sales. So don't hesitate to, uh, and monetize current uh, current assets. To finish the external API parts, uh, the external API parts is really about uh, two things. First, you can integrate commodities to focus on core business. You know, as we say, uh, companies will in integrate other people's APIs to focus on their focus on their core business. So this is what you can see with companies like Twilio for SMS, Stripe for payments, SendGrid for mails, and Algolia for search engines, right, and many many others. Uh, I just take these two examples with Lob. Lob is a it's a company that delivers an API for mailing, like snail mailing, right? So you can use that API for mailing as a service. Another one I often use is Avalara. So Avalara is a tax calculation, let's say API, right? That enables you to calculate the tax of an e-commerce cart when actually there is an order. Because in, in the US, we have so many regulations about like how the VAT can change over a specific uh, uh, county or specific state. And yes, actually, Avalara guarantees you that the cart of the e-commerce platform is respecting the VAT, the VAT law. So it's really a tiny nut and bolt of the whole system, but it's a company of a, of a thousand employee, right? So that just do this tiny bolt API, right? And so if you don't focus on, on following all the tax uh, uh, jurisprudence and you use Avalara and you can focus on your core business. So, and again, in the landscape I design, there is a business process as a service section with hundreds of APIs that actually enabled you to focus on the core business. 
to finish, it's really about the last strategy is really about revitalizing the core. Many incumbents, companies, banks, insurers, uh, retail, brick and mortar companies have actually are really stuck into their technical debt. And so, for example, let's use the example of bank, but now there is a new bank, uh, banking as a service ecosystem that is actually reproducing core banking and banking capabilities into re ready to use APIs and building bricks. So that means that traditional bank can actually use this whole ecosystem of core banking, plug and play services, cards, wallet transfer, uh, uh, you know, and, um, and payments and, and, and insurance uh, APIs to rebuild the core internally before they rebuild it for themselves. They can use third party to do it, to re highly revitalize the core. And we see many, many companies actually right now uh, that some are acquired by big banks, but that actually gather all these core capabilities and offer that to incumbent companies, to banks, insurers, and, and traditional companies to change their core and deliver fresh and new core capabilities to, uh, to their existing customer base. The last one is being compliant. Uh, just an example, especially in banking and insurance, uh, there are new regulations, PSD2 in Europe, uh, CDR in Australia, Open Banking UK in UK, and the FCC announced that in the US they're evaluating the option about like obliging banks and, and companies to open APIs to third parties, right? This is what we call open banking. And so, yeah, so if, maybe your business will be in the next month or years involved into opening APIs uh, uh, to be compliant, right? So that's the other reason to, uh, to think about uh, the API strategy. So to sum up, uh, to align IT with business, to design for business goals, uh, maybe kill technical debt thanks to API facades, diminishing time to market thanks to reusable building bricks, get business adoption thanks to uh, IT capabilities that business can understand with the name of a product and the name of a, a, a business driven capability, augment the reach externally, uh, find new business models for asset monetization, integrating commodities to enable to focus on your core business, or revitalizing, revitalizing your core by using third-party bricks that, uh, uh, that can uh, replace your core, waiting for you to replace yourself. Yeah. That's the complete API mo uh, strategy model that I wanted to present. So we will have question at the end after Tony, uh, Tony, Tony's speech. And yeah, thank you very much. And Tony, let's, uh, let's have uh, some time with, uh, uh, with you about sharing your slides and explaining how Great. we can deliver all of this. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Mehdi. Uh, as I'm switching over to my screen, I was thinking about your monolith slide and thinking how uh, nice it would be if you just kind of like in the period of time that you slided your things in, if, if that was effectively how it worked for everybody. You know, that's obviously not their experience all the time. But yeah, transition. It years from what I've seen, but yeah. 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 Tony, yours. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, what uh, we wanted to pivot from, uh, you know, talking about the strategy to talking about uh, some of the technology, but I do want to visit a few, you know, uh, customer stories as well, uh, because I, I think there's a dimensionality to the way that uh, different customers, different organizations, uh, I say customers sometimes because IBM, we, we have our customers, but different organizations approach their API strategy and what are they looking to get out of it? And, um, you know, just thinking about a few uh, that we've worked with in the past, uh, this is uh, CVS Aetna. Um, their intent was driving new revenue streams, <clears throat> but how do they do that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they were reinventing a lot of the uh, ways that they service their customers through uh, their online experiences, engaging through a web browser, you know, logging in, making those experiences consistent across all of their platforms. And then in, in the process, looking to achieve other outcomes, which were positive outcomes for the business as a whole, you know, in this particular case, you know, cutting integration costs as an example. Uh, we could look at, uh, you know, some other industries like banking, uh, which many had mentioned, you know, with uh, regula regulations, there's been a lot of push on uh, the, the openness of your APIs in order to serve uh, customers. So there's, they're trying to engage through uh, different ways to access their money, right? Um, but uh, that also op presents opportunities. And, you know, a number of banks uh, like RBL have been able to take advantage of that, that market growth in that domain in order to... Uh, to at scale, you know, millions of transactions a day, um, <clears throat> basically uh, provide valuation on that. And some of which, uh, you know, for different banks is, is through their partner channels as we were seeing on that long tail slide uh, in Medi's material. Uh, IGA, uh, 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 airport, as they were looking to reinvent their airport experience moving from an old building to a new building, uh, looking at APIs as an enabling factor for how the customer experiences 
uh, would be able to uh, help them serve customers in their airport better. Right. And so looking at APIs as an enabler to building those customer experiences. And you can see that pattern like emerging, you know, digital transformation is very largely about customer experience, improving the way that we can interact and reach our customers. You know, and then again, you'll see these patterns uh, coming out. Um, SBI, uh, State Bank of India, uh, very interesting, right? What they looked at was their mobile de device, mobile application is how do we uh, provide a way for people to access retailers, whoever they are, uh, you know, through the context of uh, a platform we create that focuses on, you know, really um, the uh, the reach uh, that they have, uh, the the financial information about the bank, the ability to interact commercially with each of these vendors, and so they really generated a whole new experience. Right? They moved into a business space they weren't in before by leveraging APIs. And uh, you know, reminded again that that slide that you shared about banking, uh, you know, the banking market. And then the kind of the, where else does banking happen? This is a little flip on that, which is this is bank moving into other domains based on the ability for APIs to allow them pivot and reach in different ways that they could never have done before. And so there's, you know, many different models. And I think uh, when you're establishing the API strategy, it's really, what are we looking to achieve? You know, is it optimization of customer experience for existing customers? Is it the scale and the reach? Is it improving the partner ecosystem? Uh, you know, and in the SBI case, is it really developing new markets that we can participate in uh, that we have adjacent reach into that, you know, we have a, an opportunity to form? Um, you know, but to do any of these things, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it really is about that API, you know, and, and I like to review what is the struggle, right? Because when we think about the technologies that are going to be useful for here, we need to look back, okay, well, what is the technology domain that we're trying to solve for? And, and I like this one, and it relates uh, a lot, you know, everybody, one of us is a retailer, we do shopping on our own. And so we can uh, think about the way that we interact with any company, whether they're brick and mortar, uh, we're at the e-commerce site or they're largely e-commerce, uh, you know, many of these experiences will be the same. And uh, if we look across the customer journey, uh, you know, where we get everything from, you know, our initial awareness of a particular thing and the research that we want to do and the post-purchase reinforcement, right, that, that you know, is a very sp uh, specific way that a retailer in this case wants to engage. And so we just look at that customer experience because most of us, you know, again, go through this uh, in our average day. Um, you know, on the, the front end, there's things like marketing and lead generation. And I want to be able to be aware of, uh, in this scenario, who is my customer, or uh, is, is this particular individual I'm looking at part of my customer loyalty program? Maybe what I want to do is, you know, in an account-based marketing scheme, um, look at them very specifically, differently, target them more effectively, and I need that information. And, you know, while customer loyalty is something that we think about perhaps in retention, obviously it has value upstream in the awareness cycle, you know, and we can look around, uh, if we pivot around call center, really call center needs reach, you know, across so many different domains. And this ability to bring this information together or to leverage processes that exist in any one of these other pillars, uh, you know, becomes the, the, the problem domain we're trying to solve. And because of uh, the heterogeneity of these information systems, right? They speak different languages, they're in different locations, they have security firewalls in between them. Just all of these problems, you know, that <clears throat> IT for many, many, many years is looking to resolve. And, and part of why, you know, the Bezos email was so effective is, you know, let's build to the, the point of view that we want to be in a position where uh, this isn't the problem every time we face it. We have really a well-defined way that these interaction models are going to happen, uh, you know, and APIs is this. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, dealing with the, the problem domain, uh, proprietary formats, uh, that's expensive because it requires skill, uh, information is structured differently, requires deep learning, subject matter experts, I need to understand, you know, is... Uh, um, uh, birth date here, you know, the same as date on the customer table, right? Like these kind of things, how do you reconcile that? Well, you, you need to know these systems. Um, security concerns, as I mentioned, moving data, and of course, everybody's got security in their mind these days, particularly as the edge of the enterprise is shifting and changing. When we think about um, hybrid, uh, uh, the hybrid world, where I've got my data centers, you know, one or more, then I've got, you know, the number of clouds I'm interacting with now, uh, whether that be infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, SaaS, you know, the organization boundary for information is so broad. You know, every one of these problems uh, is increasing in scope as we move forward, not decreasing in scope. You know, and security, of course, is part of the challenge space that, uh, that we must solve for. 
And then, uh, you know, connecting the, the apps, it's, it's slow, uh, perhaps because of latency in the connections, but, it, you know, it's slow because uh, I'm looking to achieve good outcomes, uh, getting all of this information and solving all these challenges each time becomes a problem. And so that's where API uh, is useful. And I like to talk about API-led innovation because it's really allowing my organization to innovate in ways that we couldn't have done before or at speeds that we couldn't have done before. And so when we think about the, uh, the client experience, thinking back to all those examples that we talked about, it's really how do we improve the clients that we serve better? And we, we talk about four primary domains. And I, and I like this model because it helps us to, again, get some level of focus on, uh, you know, now that we know the problems, you know, what is the, the model by which we're trying to achieve those outcomes? And so it's, it's creating, managing, securing, and socializing these APIs. And we'll walk through those uh, in some detail now. And then uh, we'll do a little bit of deep dive for the time that I have available to really just dive into create. Because I think, uh, you know, as we were seeing, there's the, the, the service, you know, the microservice service, you know, in that API layer, you know, and we have a tremendous amount of focus a lot on the API layer. Uh, we also need to equally have that focus on the service. How are we building those effective services? So again, let's walk around that and then we'll dive a little bit further into create. So create, you know, like the name applies, uh, easily create APIs that expose data to microservices. You know, these could be processes, they could be uh, third party, internal, et cetera. Uh, your enterprise application information, you know, they can reach out to SaaS services. You want to be able to create these services, uh, expose them as APIs, uh, you know, regardless of where this information is coming from. I think that's secure. Again, you know, that boundary of the organization, how are we, uh, you know, wherever that infrastructure as a service is, protecting that boundary and allowing the people who need access to have access is appropriate, right? Governance and security are enablers to allow my business to move forward, right? They restrict in order to protect, but without it, I can't actually innovate. And so security is, is important from that dimension. And so we want policy, we want smart policies uh, to be effectively applied and, you know, very strongly applied in each one of these domains uh, so that they mediate the delivery of the API. Uh, manage, uh, you know, this is where uh, we talk about personas and we say, you know, somebody is going to be able to say, yes, this is the thing I want to share, right? Uh, I, I liked your point earlier, Mehdi, about like, we're going to work in a way that we know we're building uh, an API, you know, that has that business value. Not all of these APIs necessarily need to get shared, but we build them that way. But at some point, you're going to say, this one gets shared, right? These get shared and they get provided to this community of users, right? That's a, a role is actually a white paper later in the deck uh, about a center of excellence. You know, how do you build that API product manager role? You know, that is part of that domain. Uh, so, you know, it's the people, but we'll focus a little bit more on the technology uh, with respect to this. And then socialize. How do people come to you and know that these are available? What they mean? How do I use them? How do I subscribe to them? Uh, is there a community support so that people can interact with each other about your API? Maybe it's your community you want to enable for them to work together or to work with your internal stakeholders. Uh, either way, right, we need to focus on that ability to socialize the APIs effectively if we want to get that channel expansion, even the internal channel expansion, uh, that's, that could become effective. <clears throat> Again, so it's really, you know, it's, it's a team. Uh, there's uh, various parts of this, uh, this universe that will focus on the create, uh, like the API developer. Uh, then you've got, you know, really developers who are the consumers of the APIs, right? And so it's not necessarily, it's a different person. They might be actually producers and consumers. Uh, the API product manager says, what are we sharing and how do we share it and how do we secure it? But, you know, the developer and the consumer on either side of that spectrum, I'm building that service, exposing it as an API, or now I'm going to be using that in other mobile applications that I have. And then, of course, you've got more of the architecture and the ops management, you know, and, and there's various aspects of solutions like this, which are, uh, you know, solutions like this being API management uh, integration, uh, which are relevant for those users, too. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, my, my uh, choice of uh, IT stack might be Kubernetes. Um, you know, do these technologies run effectively in that environment? How do they scale out to uh, support the non-functional requirements of latency, uh, scale out, performance, disaster recovery? And so, of course, uh, you know, an effective API management platform, uh, an effective integration platform, it's going to be able to service uh, those requirements as well. And then as we move to the IT architect, it's like, you know, we're trying to achieve these types of outcomes. You know, how does this technology lend to that? Uh, for example, many of our customers are looking at 
<clears throat> you know, the request response of APIs is a wonderful model, drives so many of those interactions. And I think about like my banking app, think about my, my airport reservation app, <laughs> which I don't use as many much during the COVID days. Uh, but, you know, often when I log in there, I'm checking the status of my flight. Uh, but sometimes, you know, what happens is it tells me that the flight was delayed. Uh, that's an event driven push. So the customer experience that I'm getting through that mobile application, it, it really, it's sometimes I want to know and sometimes I want it to tell me. And I need architectures really that support both of those models and other models as well, and you know, other protocols and other standards. And so uh, again, all of that is the domain of, of some of the IT architect. But I wanna build in uh, or drill in rather to that API developer, let's look deeply at Create and talk about some of the technologies that can make that build of the microservice, the service, you know, whether or not you're in a more traditional architecture or you're in really you know, a, a microservice, service mesh uh, area, make that an easier process. <clears throat> so um, I'll, I'll, I'll run through, I think it's about seven different uh, technologies that I think are most relevant in that way, uh, particularly as you're looking to scale this out across your organization. You know, I'll, I'll, um, I'll give a data point uh, now. Uh, we were at a, a conference about three years ago and, and going through some of the technologies you're gonna see here. And we had just basically a, you know, a, a walk up pedestal, somebody could come and say, you know, create your API. And so it just kind of guided them through a couple of steps. And uh, one of the responses we had after, at, after that was, you know, I've got a team of people building APIs for me, but I actually never thought I'd build APIs myself. You know, was, I'm, that's not my function. But I was curious to see how that worked out. And like, I, I'm surprised, like this was really easy. And it's feedback like that, which, you know, I just find is inspiring as a technology builder. You know, we, we work at IBM to build effective things. Um, so, you know, just that feedback, uh, again, just motivates us to achieve more. And so uh, first one, no code tooling. We're going to build a service, uh, and you could use so many different methods to build. You know, so many different programming languages out there. Uh, the thing that I find most attractive about no-code tooling is is that point I just shared. Is it doesn't take a developer always to build the integration service that's going to get exposed as an API. You know, really uh, with technology like this, we can scale that out across the organization. Not necessarily have to rely on IT SMEs all of the time, but effectively utilize other people in the organization. Um, and, and sometimes it's it's even more effective that way. If you think about the traditional waterfall way that we worked in the past, where we had the business analyst, uh, they wrote the spec requirements, they got them to IT, IT built some things, uh, you know, and then the business analyst is involved in the checkout, and this is a very back and forth process. You know, if I could enable that business analyst to build on his own in some cases, that's a very powerful and you know accelerating idea, right? Uh, embracing that actually helps me to go faster. They have the subject matter expertise. Uh, really, what they lack was the technology skills. So, if I can empower them with something that's easy to learn, yeah, you know, again, just great benefit. So, no code tooling, uh, and you can see, you know, graphical environments like this, uh, very effective at lowering the cost uh, of expertise. And of course, uh, when you're selecting technology like this, it needs to generate enterprise-grade artifacts, right? When we think about it, again, the IT and ops people, what we want to make sure is that, uh, you know, uh, this just doesn't build a um, widget, you know, that can get deployed someplace. It builds something that adheres to my security protocols. It builds something that can scale, that can deploy in my Kubernetes environment. And again, there's a lot of non-functional requirements that come to this domain. And so, you know, we're going to assume a lot of that stuff is there, you know, for the purpose of this discussion and just focus on no code tooling as again, that accelerator, but you'll want to go deep when you, when you start to look at technologies like this. <clears throat> uh, connector library that expands reach. Uh, I, I liked a, a number of the slides many was pulling in and talk about different vendors who are innovating. Uh, they're out, you know, in the, uh, uh, their impact to help your business go fast. Uh, is just tremendous, right? I, I, in ABC Corp, don't necessarily need to be an expert in payments. You know, if I, if that's not my core domain, I can go out to the web, find a SaaS vendor who does payments and, and link up with them. But now I've got to connect all of my processes with their stuff, right? And I could go, uh, everybody's using APIs, but not every API is the same, right? The, 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 like, <laughs> the snapping that together, it's not exactly consistent all of the time, right? And connectors is a good accelerator. It says, you know what, you don't have to know their API specifically. We'll just in our no code tooling, take care of that for you. Uh, your developer could just snap it together. And uh, you know, regardless of whether or not that'd be five different API calls to do that or two different API calls to do that, never you mind, right? Uh, uh, Non-IT SME uh, in the business domain, we'll, we'll worry about that for you. And so you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you've got that reach, right? That reach is again, the tremendous accelerator allows me to connect 
my workday, for instance, to my ITSM, maybe a service now, say new employee onboarding, open a ticket, you know, those kind of patterns across any one of these things in your internal systems, uh, it's, it's helpful to have that reach. Again, not having to go learn everybody's API structure, not having to go um, basically, you know, spend the time to uh, train everybody up in that, again, is a tremendous accelerator. <clears throat> more and more, you're going to see uh, AI-powered automation uh, in, in integration and API technologies. And a little bit more on the integration side here. We'll get a little bit more to the API side in, in a slide or two. Uh, but just staying on the integration domain for a bit, uh, this, this automation, uh, again, I'm, I, I want to come in as somebody who's not an IT specialist. But you know the problem of I've got 100 fields here and 200 fields here, and how do these things relate? Um, that that's a, uh, an area where machines just can help <clears throat> and uh, very excited about some of the work that we've done here. And, and I'll say, you know, not exclusively in the IBM thing, but we've done some really nice uh, work here, very deep learning, uh, semantic uh, relationship across uh, different fields, the ability to understand, uh, for example, a, a, a zip code and a postal code. <laughs> you know, those are the same things, right? Like we know that intuitively, machines don't. You need things like natural language processing to create those associations. And those things, you know, abound in examples. And then the relationship between many to one fields, you know, first and last is a full name. Uh, a corporate name is different than a full name. And so again, that, that ability for the machine to know these things and to assert them for you and to take the learnings of other people in your organization who may have done this before and apply that in your new scenario. Uh, again, a tremendous accelerator. And a uh, nice thing here too, is you could see in this particular case, you know, it recommends rents, rents and scores. It's fairly confident. You could see the way that that, that uh, AI came together to make that assertion uh, and drill further into it and help reconcile. All right, so now let, let's shift to the API because we, we've built now a service. Let's say we've used node code tooling. We've taken advantage of some of that, you know, uh, connector reach. We've uh, leveraged the AI to help us get, you know, towards the dealing with that heterogeneity of information systems. At the end of the day, I really want to still expose this as a spec. And as many was describing, it's got to be that business interface. Um, again, I don't want necessarily all of my people to have to know how to write good Swagger or good open API spec V3 or something, all right? Can't the technology do that for me? All right, because if I'm, you know, going through and coding all of this textually, uh, that takes time. There's finger, you know, typing. The standards actually won't be consistent. You know, even though things, all things could be Open API v3 compliant, doesn't mean they're all built the same and they follow the same standards. And so, uh, a model-driven approach to generate those, you know, open industry formats, the Open API spec. Uh, again, it's a it's a great consistency across your organization particularly when you think, okay, I want to scale out now. I want all of my teams to be able to do this. Uh, I want them to do it in a way that I can govern, ensure is consistent. Uh, each team's operating similarly uh, because I don't have that centralized hub anymore. And, and this isn't a comment that uh, uh, a, a center of excellence for API management and integration isn't a good thing. Uh, in many organizations, that's still a very powerful thing. But again, the ability to scale out the program uh, is paramount to many organizations' success. So in this case, model-driven approach generates open API swagger. You never even have to see it in, in our technology and, and some others in, in, in the industry. Again, that's powerful because, uh, again, anybody can come up and do this. And, and frankly, this is the area where somebody said, yeah, I, I never knew I'd be able to build an API. But frankly, I just built a couple of fields I wanted in my business model. It generated all of that for me. I plugged it in with my integration service and I was done. Again, a powerful way to move forward. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you're going to have questions and issues and you, you want things like interactive debuggers, right? It doesn't, um, things still go wrong, right? We need intuitive ways to inform people. Uh, how do I look at this when it doesn't produce the results I wanted? That could be, of course, that the back end isn't up and running and it's got a particular error or it's got to be, well, the, you know, the fields didn't come back in the way that I expected. I need to be able to visualize that and see it. And I need technologies, of course, like interactive debuggers. That doesn't go away just because it's not IT. Uh, specialist, uh, you know, frankly, you could even say it's even more required that we make that process simpler. <clears throat> Just uh, moving through at a little bit faster pace, but I want to make sure that we get time for questions at the end. Um, one of the uh, technologies that I'm really proud of, uh, we just launched this past year, is this automated API behavior testing. Um, it looks at the, uh, the API uh, re request and response and based on that information generates a series of test assertions 
that cover uh, you know, the shape of the API, the different fields of the API that came back in the body, and then offers the ability for someone to go in and, and customize that and say, well, yeah, you said you know, it was a five-digit code, because I know this particular API responded with a five-digit code, but really it could be five or six, and I'm going to tweak that rule. Uh, but just think about all the APIs and all the different you know, operations that execute, uh, the response variations that come back, and all the test cases you need to build around this. Uh, this ability to look at that request and response, generate the test assertions, package those up so they're repeatable through your, your continuous integration pipeline or your aggression test cycles. Uh, everybody, you know, if you want to get to those agile means of DevOps, uh, everyone needs uh, the ability to have good test infrastructure, uh, good test cases that provide that level of guarantee of quality. <clears throat> this is the type of technology you want to look at to help with that journey. And as I, I look at people who are trying to go from that monolith to the microservice, this is the area that many stumble in. It's, uh, you know, we, we've built out a tremendous uh, set of tech, you know, whatever company uh, over the years. These are rock solid enterprise uh, services. They've been running the backbone of our organization for many, many, many years. Uh, but then I asked the question, uh, you know, can you uh, run at will a regression test cycle, you know, at the push of a button? Uh, you know, and very uh, often the question is no, because, uh, you know, we, we built in a different way 10 years ago than we build now. And so, you know, that transition, when I want to go from monolith to microservice, uh, this is often where it gets hung up in, in process and cost and time. And so the ability to generate test cases based on these samples, again, is a, uh, a wonderful uh, accelerator to how you can make that transition. So, uh, you know, we, we dove in here on the create side and we talked about no code tooling, connector libraries, et cetera. Uh, but we could go around and this just the session didn't offer enough time, you know, and look at security and what would some of the requirements be there. Uh, and I think about like the global policies. Um, <clears throat> global policies, uh, again, I'm, I'm looking at this decentralized way that I've empowered the organization where many, many, many teams are now building APIs. I really want to govern them consistently. And regardless of whether they're deployed, in you know whatever cloud du jour <laughs> you you have or on premise, you know these policies need to be consistent. And so that idea of global policies, not everybody who's publishing an API is picking which of the enforcement policies for whose access and what things we check and etc. If I could do that in one place and everybody inherits it again, I, I've removed a layer of concern and I've centralized the security control, the policy control for the organization at large. And <clears throat> so some of these things again are very important. <clears throat> the, uh, the deployable on-premise or in any cloud, again, the, the, the reach of the organization, the boundary of the organization is expanding so, so broadly that, you know, can I get that consistent policy management, regardless of not it's in my data center or, you know, cloud du jour. Again, that's, uh, as I look more and more at the enterprises who are shifting to API management strategies, that is uh, paramount for so many of them uh, that they want that consistent management. So um, another aspect. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> what can I manage? Um, for years, you know, SOAP, uh, everything was SOAP. Uh, you know, everything now is generally REST, uh, but it, it's it's not going to always be that way, right? And we see other technologies that have come up, like GraphQL. <clears throat> I'm fortunate uh, to sit on that GraphQL board uh, as of just recently, uh, but, you know, wonderful emerging technology, been successful for very large enterprises already. Um, but, uh, you know, I can issue a query, it goes and resolves all of the back ends and it brings me, you know, and that happens through a RESTful uh, interface. Um, but it exposes me to other types of attacks, right? Somebody could do things that look like denial of service attacks by constructing very bad GraphQL syntax. Um, the, the ability to enforce uh, looks different in a GraphQL model than it does in a REST API model, uh, which was actually more similar to a SOAP. And so, um, you know, uh, what technologies do you want to use? Which of these uh, standards and, and different protocols are most important to your organization? And can you manage effectively any one of those? Uh, you know, the, uh, the one that I was referring to before with the, the app, the mobile app, <clears throat> you know, from looking at event-driven architectures versus uh, more the API request response architectures. Again, different domain of challenge where you need a different set of things that can be enforced and governed. And of course, how you want to produce those and manage those out to your ecosystem. 
And then socialize. Uh, it was great to see, you know, a couple of uh, slides that many included about uh, different um, portals that people present. You know, they brand those for their image. They have a corporate identity that they're able to assert, not just through their web interface to their primary customers, but also through their API interface to their partner community inside their intranet to their internal stakeholders and keep that branding consistent. But it's not just the branding that's important, of course, it's the, you know, what's that experience that I want? You know, can I package up things, uh, these APIs differently than those other APIs? Because this partner has access to all of this information, but this one I can't give any personal identifiable information to. You need that granularity of control as you're looking at the portal uh, in the subscribers, you know, these people who are going to be your API consumers. And then, of course, the community building features, you know, can they, uh, where I want them to work with each other uh, around my APIs to discover more information, to get the kind of support that I want them to feel they have, you know, for my, for my org as, as they're coming in. And so, again, you know, uh, so many different dimensions. And the final one I just talked about real quickly is, uh, you know, where does all of this run? Can it run in uh, Kubernetes environments? Can it run consistently across different clouds? Uh, definitely, this is that you know non-functional requirement. It's really not only about the API management features; it's about the deployment model, particularly as I move and shift into hybrid cloud. And of course, uh, technologies like Red Hat, OpenShift, and of course at IBM, we love this now uh, as of uh, last year. But uh, great technology, Kubernetes is the future for so many different platforms. Uh, you know, and uh, we're we're not exclusive as far as how the API management technology runs from IBM. Uh, but we're very, very, very particularly opinionated that OpenShift is, is a, a strong, strong platform for this. Uh, just wanted to leave a few other things uh, just in wrap up, uh, you know, a number of uh, different articles. If you found uh, much of uh, this discussion useful, uh, you'll find that these will be helpful in different ways. So kind of clockwise around uh, principles for API security, if you're new to API management, uh, you're thinking about you know, what does protecting an API mean? What does protecting my corporate assets mean? Uh, you know, there's a security division in my organization, but they may not have an expertise in the API domain either. This is a wonderful primer, uh, not very long, but it gives you the basics to how you understand this and how you can go ahead and explore uh, the kind of things you need to be aware of as you start that process. Can you trust your APIs? That uh, starts to look more at the, uh, I want to move into uh, more uh, automated API regression testing cycles. I'm looking for technology there how do these two things come together, right? Effective testing methods for API management. Uh, Agile API development empowered uh, the uh, looking at, uh, you know, again, moving, shifting from old waterfall approach, approaches to agile pipelines. Uh, my API management needs to be a part of that as things are coming through my organization. How do I ensure that, you know, with the test automation that I have and all these wonderful test cases, I can do my deployment pipeline that is the benefactor of a lot of that work. And so, and then finally, the recommendations for the API Economy Center of Excellence. Again, this is if you're if you're new or maybe even you're questioning whether or not you're being as effective as you might wanna be. Uh, this paper written by Alan Glickenhaus, he's a, a long time API Day speaker, a great paper on like, what does a successful organization structure? How do they structure? What are the roles that they need to consider? You saw some of those on one of the slides where we had the developer, the product manager, the consumer, goes through those in more detail. What are the goals? Why is product management? more of a business thing than it is an IT thing. Again, a great uh, perspective that will help you accelerate. Um, <clears throat> last two slides, uh, you know, from an IBM perspective, we're very proud of our tech, uh, API Connect, if you're looking for, uh, you know, something to help you on that journey, uh, we, we've got a, a, an award-winning technology here. And finally, if you wanna go out to our IBM website, of course, there's a lot more information there. Uh, Mehdi, with that, I uh, invite you to come back online. Yeah. I think we, uh, yeah. we hit our target of about 60 minutes. Yeah, for, for the last minute, we have a question from Christopher McConnell. What advice can you recommend for someone new to APIs and wanting to get their hands dirty? Programming language, software platforms, and everything. Yeah, uh, you know, again, I would say uh, it's easy to start with some of the tech that we talked about today. Uh, if you look at the IBM integration portfolio where we have our API management and our application integration, gives you that no code tooling, generates the swagger for you. You get to see all that swagger, say how effectively did these three operations I just automatically generate and materialize into open API spec. You know, if you so if you want to dig in, you can. Uh, if you want to stay at that, you know, 20,000 foot level, it allows you to do that as well. And then of course our API management technology, uh, you know, the, these APIs can come from anywhere. We give you those wonderful accelerators with the integration tech that we put alongside of it. Uh, but if you are, uh, you know, doing uh, Node.js and that's your passion, uh, you know, effectively these things plug in very, very neatly into uh, the API management tech as well. So 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would recommend also uh, no code at, the, at first, right? To be able to understand uh, how APIs interact with each other uh, and everything. And, and about programming languages, there are now a uh, framework in almost every programming language to use APIs, uh, uh, right? So, so um, it's okay, but like a main programming language, like who works also on the front end and back end, like JavaScript and others, can, can help. But any, any programming language, you can work, you can work uh, uh, with APIs. Uh, there, so yeah, no code first. Also, but API product management. Uh, you, there is a book called API product management that may help you to understand and go and dive a little bit more into into the technical aspect. Uh, also, the Open API specifications also helps you to design APIs a little bit more easily and generate documentation and 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 mockups and everything. So so yeah, no code then uh, API specifications and then going into programming language to really understand APIs. Yeah, Tony, I think that was great. Uh, that was great uh, uh, for, for this. Just to say for all, for all attendees, the, the recording uh, will be sent to you all and you will be able to share it. Uh, the, the webinar will be able for replay for colleagues who wanted to join and who could not. So you will be able to share it with other people of your team. Thank you very much, Tony, uh, for, for this. It was quite compelling on, the, on the, the, the people aspect, the technical aspect, the practice aspect. And I hope uh, also the, the my first part on the co complete EPS strategy model was uh, insightful. Uh, let's connect uh, later all at an, an EPI days event or at a, a next Tony Curcio presentation. Have a good one, everybody, and looking forward uh, meeting you uh, soon online or in real life at an EPI conference event. Thanks, Bye. Man.